Praise the Lord. If you would, turn in your Bibles to, uh, let's see, where are we at here? We are in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you would, please. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And he's right, I did mention, fight the good fight. Uh, he mentioned that song for their anniversary. And I'm very thankful for being here today. It's been a blessing. And uh, I'm thankful for your family. I really am, Brother Johnson. I'm excited for everything God's doing here. I look forward to hearing more reports. And he's got me fired up for a couple things. And uh, we, our church, we go to the flea market on the first Saturday of the week. And we give out Bibles and preach the gospel and give out bumper stickers and talk to folks. And uh, they took it to a whole other level with the fairs and festivals. And, and uh, so I'm going to follow suit. And we're going to do that next year. I'm making a plan for the whole year, trying to get to every festival we can in the area to see what the Lord can do for us. So I'm really excited for that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you would look at verse number 12, please. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. The talk of my sermon is fight the good fight of faith, if you will. Um, and that is something that we as Christians are called to do. We are called to fight the good fight of faith. And when it says the good fight, I think it's important to notice that the fight of faith is, is different than some of the other fights that we typically get ourselves involved in. Too many times we get involved in the, the emotions of this world, the politics. And I'm a very outspoken political person. In fact, I, you know, well, don't, no politics and no religion. I said, we're going to take everything from us? I mean, come on, we got to talk about these things. But the truth is, the reality is, is we're not called to fight a political fight while we're here. Now, John the Baptist was extremely political. He went to the governor and he told him that, that his adultery was unlawful and he lost his head over it. So, I mean, it's a Baptist tradition to be political, especially if you know American history. It was, it was the Baptists that actually fought for the freedom to preach the Bible, uh, and the Presbyterians and the Catholics and everybody else wanted to fight against us. So it is a, a truly Baptist thing. Uh, and the political landscape today, obviously, it's, it's very messed up, and there's a lot going on. I often think about Kent Hovind. You guys know who I'm talking about. Most of you probably know Kent Hovind fascinating things that he had to teach. And I mean, a lot of new believers really uh, learned a lot about creation defense and creation evangelism from Kent Hovind, but yet he fought the wrong fight. He was legally right on a lot of the things that he stood on, but that doesn't matter because the God of this world, Satan, still stole 10 years from his ministry and stole a few years of his life's wife, and uh, destroyed his family, and the devil's not done wrecking his ministry because he was fighting the wrong fight. It's very important for us to remember that we are called to fight the good fight. Uh, fight is a strong and abrasive word. I would hate to see it on the wall, but when he says the good fight, he's saying fight for what's good. Fight the good fight of faith. We've been called to defend the faith. In Philippians 1, he says, knowing that I am set for a defense of the gospel. Paul said, I'm here to defend the gospel. You, we, you can be a Democrat and I'm a Republican or you're a Green and I'm a Libertarian and, and we can still get along. But when you cross that line of faith and you preach a false gospel, that's when I'm going to fight the good fight Amen. of faith. It's important for us to remember. I, I have to read this message. This uh, came through on October the 29th, 2023. At 1,335 hours, our commander-in-chief has initiated the wartime cabinet. After engagements on multiple fronts and hostile enemy interactions, there is now a need to defend our nation. Thereby, he has declared war upon the global powers of evil. Make no mistake, this is a war of ideology. You either with us or you're supporting the enemy. All hands on deck. All able-bodied souls will be required to report for combat duty. Peaceful life as we have known it has forever changed. This is not a drill. We are at war. God help America. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I need your help today. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you would pray. Lord, I ask that you would, you would help me to pray right now. I ask that you would fill those that hear this with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you would give us the mind of Christ and understand what your will is. Lord, I pray that you would magnify your word right now and help us to understand truly what our calling is. 
And I humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are here. We are called to fight the good fight of faith. And we are not called to get entangled with everything else that goes on in this world. And I know, I know, we have to be in this world. We're not of this world, but we're in this world, and we have to deal with this world, and we deal with people that are caught up with this worldly mentality, and the devil attacks us through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and one of those three things will get any one of you. In fact, it probably already has gotten you or is continuing to get you, if you will, and keep you from the real fight. We get tangled up in politics or fighting the tax argument. Yeah, but the 16th Amendment wasn't ratified. Doesn't matter. They're still going to get you. You can't win that. I'll, I'll file a piece of paper, and that'll show them that their paper's no good. Yeah, yeah, good luck on that, right? And then maybe you'll lose 10 years of your life fighting the wrong fight. I mean, most Christians face it. Oh, they're, they're, they're like fighting the HOA. They told me I have to hide my garbage cans behind a fence, and I'll show them. I'll really get to them, you know. I'll get even. <laughs> I mean, we're, and then most Christians, listen, most Christians are saying, we need to go fight that war in the Middle East. If we don't go fight them over there, they're going to come get us over here. It's called preemptive war. It's a sin. It's a sin. Frank's looking at me weird. I'm going to go smack Frank and set him straight so he doesn't come up here and punch me. You'd say, You're, what are you doing? That's unchristian-like. Well, as a nation, that's what we've been doing, and it's sinful and it's ungodly. Most Christians are fighting their spouse, aren't they? They're not fighting the good fight of faith. They're fighting their doctors, arguing with their doctors. Most Christians are fighting the brethren. Yeah, That's a fact. That's uh, f most fundamental independent Baptist churches are, they've lost their vision. You know, over there, he's not quite dressing like me. He doesn't do what I do, and his kids don't do this, and his wife doesn't do that. And we start pointing our guns on the inside, and we want to tear each other up and destroy each other, and then the devil wins. We are called to fight the good fight of faith. If you would go to Ephesians chapter 6. This is very interesting that just this week we're out uh, preaching the gospel. We're knocking on doors, inviting people to the big event that you guys have here. And it's obvious that you guys, I believe, Temple Baptist Church has picked a fight. What happened on Wednesday, brother? We're knocking on doors. We hit one person after another. Like, no, you got to do the works. If you don't get baptized, you're not saved. It's the water that washes away your sin. Like, every, like one after another after another. I'm like, brother, there is a spiritual stronghold in this area. Like this little apartment complex, the devil's got a stronghold. And so he starts talking to somebody. This lady stops what she's doing. She's across the street. Her car door's open. She gets out and she starts, you can't, you can't be in here. You're not allowed to be in here. you got to get, that's trespassing. And I just kind of smile away. Probably made her even more, yeah, you know, keep going, you know, ignore her. That probably made her even more mad. She comes over and, what are you, what's going on? And I hand her a flyer. Hey, we're just out, we're preaching the gospel, inviting folks to church. And she's, oh, I know your church. You were down at the fair with that old man in the tie, weren't you? And that's the old man right there, by the way. Oh, no, no, no. I know. You wouldn't lie to a preacher, would you? No, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, but she's, I know your church. You're out there. You were at the fair, weren't you? Yeah, Temple Baptist Church. We're at, we were at the fair preaching the gospel, trying to get souls saved. And she says, well, I don't believe like you. And she did. And she went on to espouse her false doctrine, her works-based salvation, her lordship salvation. And he throws some verses at her. Yeah, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, saved through faith. That's what it says. Saved through faith. Well, you know, and she's going, you know, a water dog, right? She wants to trust in her own works. Um, guys, you have picked a fight. You have a reputation in this town for preaching the gospel, standing on the gospel. We don't trust in our own works. We trust in the finished work of Christ. And now that we're saved, you know what? We have a calling, and it's to fight the good fight of faith. You have a purpose in God's body, and it's to fight the good fight of faith. It's not to just sit at home and watch TV. It's not to get lackadaisical. God has a plan for you, and he's going to equip you to do what he wants you to do. And I really believe, I don't believe in the word random. You know, the word, oh, that's so random. I don't, I don't believe in random. There is no such thing as random. Even in computers, well, there's RAM, random access memory. No, it's seemingly random. It's a pattern, and it seems random, but it's not. It's by a pattern. It actually is. Uh, there are seemingly random things, but I believe there are divine appointments. We're, we're out at the, the fort over there by the Emerald Coast, or where was it? Emerald Isle. Emerald Isle. 
so we're at, at the fort and we, we start talking to this lady because she's pregnant. And then like within minutes, I start telling her she's about to give birth. And I start talking to her about vaccines and childbirth and home birth and all. And she's like, I can't believe this. This is a divine appointment. We've been talking about this the whole time. And I have questions. It's like, well, praise the Lord. And we got to pray for her and everything else. Now, fight the good fight of faith. We walk by faith that God has divine appointments for us. And the problem is most of us will not open our mouth because we're afraid we're afraid of stepping on somebody's toes or offending some liberal, right? And I mean, she's watching, forgive me, but she looked liberal, you know, that doesn't matter. Jesus said, judge me, why? Because we judge by appearance. Sometimes it's the ones you would least suspect that they really want to hear the most. Ephesians 6, rather, look at verse 11 with me for a second. Guys, your church is known, you have a reputation, you're in the fight. The battle's on. Verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. The devil is no good for nothing. He is rotten. He is sneaky. He's tricky. He wants to trip you up. And here he's commanding you to get suited up in the armor of God, to walk in the spirit and stand against. You understand when he says stand, that doesn't just mean like, oh, please don't push me over. That means to advance. He's talking about stand your ground, hold your ground, hold the fort, don't let up. When he says stand, he doesn't just say it once. You know, when God says something twice, he really ought to get your attention. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every matter be established. He uses the word stand four times here. Four times. Look at this. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not our fight. It's not people. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, and these are the things that get me angry. I really believe the majority of the people up in Washington are probably possessed with a devil. Like they know what they're doing. They've seared their conscience. They hate God. They're actively working against him. I'm not saying they're all unsavable, but I'm trying to make a point here. Yeah, it's not the flesh. If we held them down and twisted their arm and tried to set them straight, it wouldn't fix anything. It's a spiritual sickness in their heart. It is spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, get used to it. This is who's in control of Washington, D.C., Hollywood, the Nashville music scene, the Atlanta music scene, uh, London banking industry, uh, the Vatican. I mean, run on down the line. This is who's in control of this world. The God of this world is Satan, and he has certain powers here, but that's okay. We're not wrestling flesh and blood. You don't have to know jujitsu or Muay Thai to be able to win. It's spiritual. Amen. Look what he says in verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. There it is again. Withstand. Withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. There is an evil day coming. Evil does not always mean wicked. Evil means harm. And there is a day that the devil may get one on you, and he's going to hurt you. He's going to hurt your house. He's going to do damage to your house. And he's saying, it's because you didn't have your armor on. You weren't ready. You weren't withstanding the devil. He ends by saying, stand. He begins in verse 14 by saying, stand. He says, stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth is the pillar and the ground of truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. We have the truth. He says, having your loins girt about with the truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Say, what's my purpose? Well, you get the truth and then you get your boots on and you get out in the world. And you get out and you preach the gospel. This is what we've been called to do. You understand that telling somebody... Your testimony of how you changed your life, it can't save anyone. It's only by the power of the gospel. And most Christians don't even know where to go. Most of them don't even understand. The whole gospel presentation is in John 3, 16 or in Romans 6, 23. Man, start with just one of those and break it down and be able to preach the gospel from that one verse, if nothing else. But then build upon that and prepare and look for opportunities. And here's one of the things I promise you. Listen, if you prepare yourself to learn to preach the gospel, you will find opportunities, Amen. right? It's like the old adage, if, if all you have is a hammer, 
Well, that's a nail. That's a nail. That we say, look, oh, I've got the gospel. Oh, there's a lost person right there, man. Let's go give it to them. They need it, right? I'm here going to see lost people. Look what else he says. Uh oh, I lost my place. He says in verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Satan is firing darts at you. He's shooting fiery arrows. And most of us don't have enough faith to withstand the devil. We're weak in our faith. We don't have the confidence to go out there and get in the warfare. Yeah, but haven't you seen the headlines, brother? They're winning. Oh, man, so much the more. It's getting bad out there. Take your shield. Have some faith. Trust in God. Get in the battle. He says in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Again, you can't do it without the sword. I got my shield. I got my helmet. Yeah, how are you going to hit them? Now, I do believe that the shield was a weapon also. That shield of faith is a weapon, a slaughtering weapon, but it's also for a defense. The sword is the same way. It's a slaughtering weapon, but it can also be used for a defense. And most people don't have faith. They don't have the word in their heart. All they have are stories. I did it again. I lost my place. Oh, here we are. Verse 18. Sorry, guys. Praying always. Here it is. Praying always. You mean like every step of the day? Every step. You mean every moment of the day, everywhere you go. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. He's saying pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Okay, I'm suited up. I got my armor on. What for? To go out and explain it to people. We have the power to answer any question that's out there through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures. We can overcome, we can dissolve doubts. That's what we're called to do. To literally dissolve doubts where they just melt away and they say, that makes sense. God is good. Salvation is easy. Look what he says, verse 24, which I am an ambassador in bonds. He says, I'm the Lord's bond man. He's saying, I'm a servant to the Lord, right? That therefore I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychius, a beloved brother and a faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known unto you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Now get this, verse 23 and 24. We have warfare. We're in the battle. The fight is on, right? So what does it look like? Well, it's the fight of faith, right? What do we do? We get suited up in our armor. But pay attention to these last two verses. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't attack your brother. We're too busy fighting each other and squabbling over things, and we won't work together and serve the Lord and build each other up. I thank God when people can come together in unity and grow from one another and uh, be peacemakers with one another. He says in verse 24, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. He says, peace and grace and love and truth. That's what we need to give each other. Amen. And then let's get together and go out there and <laughs> win some souls for the Lord. Amen. I want to give you three points and I'll be brief. Go to 1 Timothy 3.15. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. There's three areas that we fight the good fight that we need to prepare. I'll give you the three points and I'll explain them as we go. It's the fort. It's the family, and it's your feelings. I want to look at the fort first. What is the fort? Well, I'll tell you, the fort is the local church. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ has given us a local congregation, people that we come together to serve with. He says in verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. I mean, it's neat. You, you have pillars in here. You know, the pillar holds up the wall. The structure is built upon it. Obviously, it, the foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. And he says, well, how do we disseminate that? How do we teach that? How do we ensure it right here through preaching the word of God, through coming together and encouraging one another and having doctrinal conversations at church? I mean, coming together with each other. Notice he didn't say that the walls we're the church. No, no. I said it this morning. There's no Monday morning when we're all cleared out of here. There's no Holy Spirit in here. 
Now, God's everywhere. Don't get me wrong, but the Holy Spirit's inside of you. Church means congregation. Church means assembly. That's when we gather together for a purpose. We're called out. We've stopped our week. We're separated. We say, now is the time. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's sing to the Lord. Wasn't that great picking the favorites? What a good little thing. I'm going to borrow that for my church. He says, look at it. He says, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of and ground of the truth. We are the boots on the ground. We're the local church. This is home base. This is the fort. Our church in particular, we've been in Jacksonville now for six years. And we've been through, we're in our fourth building now. From fort to fort to fort to fort. God continues to give us opportunities. One, we went from little to big to little to huge. And it's like, well, God's doing something amazing here. Right? And it's like, you know, we, we attacked and we took some ground and we took a bigger fort and God just provided and gave to us. And then we got attacked and we slaughtered and we, oh man, we had some losses, brother. We had some losses and we had some spiritual battles we had to learn that we had to overcome. And God had lessons for us. Anytime you go through a hard time, don't say why, Lord. Say what, Lord? Say, Lord, what am I supposed to learn from this so that I can minister to somebody else? That's good. Well, he yeah. did. He taught us some things, and we got stronger, and we trusted him for a miracle. And boy, did he ever give us a miracle. I mean, four times, five times bigger than we had or expected. Amazing. He gave us a bigger fort. I want to see. I want to hear a report from you guys. You say, brother, you're not going to believe it. There's no room for elbows anymore. We're, we're looking for another fort. No one hear another report, brother. You're not going to believe what happened. God gave us another fort. Yes, we need the walls, but it's not the walls that get people saved. It's not the walls that uphold the truth. It's the Holy Spirit inside of you. Amen. My first point is the fort, the local church. The boots on the ground. Go to Hebrews 10, a few pages over. Hebrews 10, most of you know it. I could quote it to you, but I want, I want you to see it. It's so important. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The word provoke means to pick a fight is how I see it. If somebody comes up to you in the store and they start prodding you in the chest... They're like picking a fight. They're provoking you, right, into wrath. We're not supposed to provoke our children. But I just love how the Bible uses this word. Pro consider. I need to consider Brother Frank. I need to consider Brother Jim. And I need to provoke you, not violently or roughly. He says, unto love and to good works. Amen. I'm here to remind you that we have a job to do. It's the same task. Now, you're different than me, and yours, your ministry is different than mine, etc. But we have that same vision. We're casting that same vision as leaders. God has a plan. We see souls saved. We raise up families to live for him. We have that same vision. We work together in a unique way as we come together. But we come together every week, and I encourage you and provoke you. Hey, brother. Brother Frank, don't forget. Brother Greg, don't forget. We have a vision. We've got somewhere we're going. We've got something we need to do, right? He provoked to good works. Can you imagine somebody, like, putting their finger in their chest like they're going to pick a fight with you to get you to do what's good? Brother Mike, I love your church. Your daughter has been a good influence on my daughter. Amen. And there's things, there's habits she picked up from your daughter that are good and godly. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, young lady. That's what church is all about. Amen. We need to encourage each other. Provoke into good works. Look at the next verse, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Don't reject church. <laughs> Come together. Help each other. Work together. Amen. Don't let your pride get in the way. Don't let your schedule get in the way. Don't let work get in the way of you coming together to build people up for the glory of God. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, especially since uh, uh, the cold 19 went around the world and back and everybody's scared to death of meeting in a public place. And Brother Jim, do you guys handshake around? Here? Yeah, we handshake. You don't do the little, uh, don't, do, don't do the fist bump, man. We, give, me, give me a hug. You know what I mean? like, we're not afraid of it, right? <laughs> Look what he says. He says, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you, have you guys see the day approaching? 
Do you see it coming in the news? Do you see what's happening? It's getting worse. I mean, it's worse than Babylon. They want to neuter your children. I mean, they want to, they just want all out perversion everywhere you go. So much the more as you see the day approaching, what's he say? Provoke one another unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but rather exhorting one another. I love the word exhort. It's equivalent to the word motivate. The word motivate did not exist in 1611 or even 1769, 1762, 1850, whichever, whichever King James you've got. It didn't really exist back then, but it's an equivalent. Yeah, it's good. It's good. I'm here to motivate you to not lose your vision of serving the Lord for the rest of your life. Plain and simple. We need it. We need to secure the fort. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Go back just a couple pages. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Fight the good fight of faith. Congratulations, men. You are now leading a family during wartime. If you haven't noticed, there's world war all around us. This is a wartime church. There's spiritual warfare all around us. And now you are a wartime church. So how do we fight this fight? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Step on, men, be strong. Your strength is in Christ. It's not in yourself. Verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You say, why do we have a local church where we gather together? I can tune in to a, a thousand different pastors, so-called, from home. I can live stream it, brother, and feel the Spirit. Can you? It's not the same. He tells us to gather, to congregate, to assemble. That's what the church means. Why? So we can look each other in the eyes and talk about a verse and say, brother, keep up the fight. Don't give up. Don't, I mean, hey, hold the fort for I am caught. Right? We're here to work together. You can't do that through a live stream. You just can't do that. It's not the same. And notice here he says, Commit thou to faithful men. You know what part of his vision is? To train up young men. To go out and to do the same thing. To reproduce yourself spiritually. We're so caught up on our reproduction in the flesh. Wow, brother, how many kids you got? Twelve and counting. Oh, good for you. Are they saved? Well, I don't know. Has the Lord drawn them yet? Ooh, that's not good. Right? Boy, thank God for that family of six that came this morning. Amen. How cool was that? God is good. Amen. He says that we gather together, look, to commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Uh, we just had uh, Youth Sunday. Last Sunday night, I sat on the front row. I didn't have to do a thing. I didn't even sit up on the stage. I just sat back, and we had an 11-year-old that gave the order of events. And we had a 10-year-old come and lead a song. We had another, he's probably eight, he came in, and we had, and we had a, a seven-year-old that gave a, a few verses, a, a mini-sermon, if you will. Then we had an 11-year-old that gave a few verses. Then we had Brother Luke. I bring this up because Brother Frank was asking about Brother Luke. Uh, Brother Luke preached a great little sermon for us. I've been working with Luke in the Lord for six years. I'm not calling him all my fruit. No, no, no. His dad is training him up, and he comes to a local church. I met this kid six years ago. I call, he was a kid back then. He was short. He was scrawny. He had a squeaky voice, and he had a list of songs. He said, "He said, Brother Fan, Brother Fan, I got like, I've got like uh, 35 songs. Can I be your piano player? So, yes, sir. Amen. We had a lady in the church. Boy, she could play anything. I don't, you know, I want to give that young man a chance. And he did, and he played, and he got better and better. I mean, he's amazing today. It's awesome what he can do. But not only that, my vision for Jacksonville, Florida has been training up young men also. Amen. The very first month, we had what I call a men's preaching night. Every other church I've been in, it was kind of like there was a stranglehold on the pulpit. Yeah, hey, brother, can I help? No, oh, box you out. I'll box you out. Yeah. Men's preaching night. At least a 15-minute sermon. Brother Luke's first one was probably five or ten minutes. For six years, consistently, he preached, he preached, he preached, he preached. He can hold his weight now. He can preach full sermons. He's a good preacher. 
He's an awesome testimony to what a local church can do in that the older men have been encouraging this young man. Hey, young man, keep it up. This is part of the plan. Sorry, I keep losing my place. Where are we at? Where are you guys at? Second Timothy. Thank you, sir. Verse number chapter two, verse two. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You're in the fight. You've been drafted. You're saved. You're in the battle. You're in the ranks. He calls you a good soldier. That's every one of you. Men, women, children, boys and girls, elderly. If you're saved, you're drafted. You're in the army. Verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Ah, there's the problem. Can you imagine somebody on the battlefield? Pow, pow, pew, pew, pow, pow. Oh, hold on. My Twitter stock just went over, you know, woo -woo, you know, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to be entangled. We're supposed to be reproducing ourselves spiritually. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Isn't it neat? Once you're saved, God chooses you for a ministry. God has chosen you to a certain ministry, and it's probably different than mine. Maybe it's similar to mine. But God has chosen you for a ministry, and we're not all the same. Uh, Gunny, they, they didn't let you cook, did they? Now, he, he helped with the food today, right? I imagine he's a good cook as well, right? Uh, you know, certain, what's that? He cooks a lot. He cooks a lot. All right. So, so not only a marksman, but also a chef. Right, but you know, typically in the army, you're a soldier. I mean, uh, Brother Jim, did you ever jump out of a plane? Did you do it every day? Were you an expert on airplane mechanics? So you weren't called to that ministry, were you? But you sure helped the big picture, didn't you? As a diver, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, I built the new world order. Guilty. No, I'm just kidding. All right, sorry to pick on you. <laughs> God's good and long-suffering, and he uses all of us in unique places. Brother Jake that goes to our church, he was a recruiter for years. And every, I mean, like every other Sunday, he'd come in with a story, and he's like, man, I got these kids, and I, we had this two-hour drive. I had to drive them down to the base. And I said, so, if you die today, you're 100% sure. I mean, I mean, consistently, one after another, he thought, if the least I could get them into the Lord's army before I put them into the world's army, and we get their soul, not only if we could just get their heart and keep their heart and get them on fire for the Lord and get them in a local church where they can serve and help and build and just see it all the way out and build up a family. Amen. If you would go to Genesis 18. Genesis chapter 18. I'm almost done, I think. Fort family and feelings. These are the three ways that we as a good soldier need to make sure that we are not entangling ourselves, that we are fighting the good fight and we're not fighting the wrong fight. It's so easy to get distracted and you end up fighting the wrong fight. You really, you're doing more damage than you are good. God's will is you fight the good fight of faith. You're in a battle. Your church has a reputation of going out and preaching the gospel and telling people that without Christ, they're on their way to hell. That's controversial, isn't it? That's confrontational, isn't it? And yet you compel them in love. In Genesis 18, if you will, again, my next point is family. Why? Listen, listen. Church is family. Church is for family. It's for families to grow and learn how to train up families. Church is for making new families. Brother Luke got married and his wife's now expecting. I mean, just he's a new family we've added to the church, right? Now, he's been playing the piano for six years since he was 12, and there's been a young lady sitting in the pew the whole time, and that's where they fell in love, and that's where they got married, and that's where they're serving God. Church is family. Church is for families. Churches for making families. Amen. In Genesis 18, if you would, look at verse number 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment 
that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. I want you to understand, Abraham was blessed by God because God said, I know what he's going to do. And he's going to train up his family, but not just his family, everyone in his household. I want you to understand that we all come together as different body members. We are one body. Old Testament, New Testament, it says it's one body in Christ. Uh, the people here today, as, as you've met together, uh, you don't have to bring us a letter of what church you came from. No, God has set you here today as part of the body of Christ, and we're a local body today. It's not a universal church, and the, there are those that would say, well, I'm, I'm just an old guy, and I'm not even married, and I don't have any kids anymore. Well, God's still using you. Amen. I want you to understand that the elderly, God is using them to encourage the next generation of families. You are a cog in the wheel. You are part of the system. You are a part of the body. You are a puzzle piece in the big picture. And God has a plan for everybody. And if you say, well, I'm not married. What can I do yet? Oh, believe me. God has a big plan for you while you're yet married. Amen. Once you get married, it's a lot harder. We talked about that this morning, right? Amen. I cannot come for I, I, I'm married and I cannot afford the gas money. That's not how it goes. That was the NIV. Sorry. <laughs> if you would, go with me to Deuteronomy 6. So... He knew that he would train up his family. So there's three areas. The fort, the local church. The family, church is for family, and this is where the fight is at. You understand, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. What that quotes, it says they'll become a prey. You understand the devil knows that if he can get dad out of the picture, I mean, the, the statistical odds of abuse are just phenomenal. And then, oh. Next husband, it goes up even more, and it goes up again. And it's like you come to the point where it's just like you're guaranteeing that your children are going to be abused and hurt when you get dad out of the picture. And then our government wants to pay to keep fathers out of the picture. It really is bizarre. This is the fruit of the generation we live in where children don't know what's right and wrong. Uh, this is their prophet. They listen to this. This is where they get their doctrine. This is where they get their philosophy and their opinion, and it comes at them so fast, one after another, they can't even keep up with it or remember what they've seen. I mean, it's a form of mind control, and it's hypnotizing, and they're just entranced. And the next thing that comes on, they're going to believe it. So, hey, I say fight them right here, too. Put the gospel on there while you're at it. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Fight the good fight of faith. How? In my family. How? Making sure the next generation can fight. Look at verse 7. Deuteronomy 6, verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently. Now, does anybody's Bible here, does it say, send them to the public school system? Does it say, send them to a Christian school? It says, thou. King James, that means singular. Dad, you're responsible for what your children learn. The buck stops with the buck. It's on you. He says, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house. Okay, so when you're sitting down at home. When thou walkest by the way. When you're outside of the house during the day, right? When thou liest down. So at night, you know, your bedtime uh, Bible study. And when thou risest up. That's literally every time of the day. America is being destroyed from within. It's being eroded. Right. Because dad is not teaching the Bible to the children. Amen. How do we fight the good fight of faith? I'll tell you how. You get in a local church, and dad, you learn how to stand on the word of God and how to train your children and how to support your wife and how to love your family and how to preach the gospel and let God take care of the rest of the details. We can't stop what they're doing with the Federal Reserve, and we can't stop what they're doing in Washington. Sometimes I wonder if it's even pointless talking about it. And I should just know Christ. That's it. That's what they need to hear. If you will, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're almost done. The fort, the family, and finally I want to talk about the feelings. And when I say feelings, I, I know we live in a real touchy-feely snowflake society. <laughs> I want to talk about the Christian perspective, the mind and the body. If your soul is already sealed unto the day of redemption, right? We're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise it talks about in Ephesians. Okay, so I'm saved. There's nothing I can do to lose it. Now what? Great question. Well, let's get your mind under control so you can get your body under control so you can use it for God's glory. Because the problem is the devil knows how to... Now look, if you're saved, I don't believe you can be possessed. 
But I believe the devil can whisper in your ear and tempt you, and you can choose to open that door and let the devil in your house. We all have that temptation. I want to talk about the feelings. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is one of the most powerful passages. I believe, I believe every man of God should have this like memorized in here. I believe this is super important. You need to add this to your artillery. Like put that bullet in your gun. Look at verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We already heard that earlier. It's reminding us who the enemy really is. When you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, what do you say? I have found the enemy. I see him right here. It's that guy in the mirror. I got to fight this guy right here if Jesus is going to get any glory in my life. It's not my wife and the guy next door and the boss and the co-worker. It's me. It's your own flesh. The old man that's still present with you. Romans 6, he says, the things that I would do, I do not. The things that I hate, that do I. I mean, talk about confusing. It's like Paul is literally saying, I'm carnal. I'm sold to sin. I'm in this body of death. Oh, wretched man that I am. I mean, Paul is really singing the woes. And he's the best Christian we know. And he says, and I still sin every day. Wake up call. There's spiritual warfare. Get a hold of your mind, your heart so that you can get a hold of your body. Look at the next verse, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have spiritual weapons to fight this. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let's meditate on this verse for a second. Cast down imaginations. When that temptation comes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Ooh, look at me. Cast it down. If you have to literally, when I memorized this verse and it became such a help to me, I would literally like visualize myself like taking a thought and like casting it down. Like, get out of here, devil. Get out of my mind. I don't want you in my heart. I don't want to think like that. I don't want to go that way. You leave me alone. Look at what it cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. That's what these prideful thoughts do. Well, you're so much better than them. You don't need to go over there. Why don't you do? And, and that's the devil just tempting you to think you're better, and you're you're not in the warfare like everybody else. You're not subject to these. He says, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You're driving down the road. Somebody cuts you off. You grit your teeth. You shake your fist. I'll tell you what I oughta. And you say, wait a minute, am I obeying Christ? Thinking like that. We have to work on every single thought. Now, we were told earlier to pray without ceasing. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication. And, but not just for ourselves, for others. The key to this, I really believe, is when you become selfless and, and you're having a problem, you're struggling with some sin, you got something in your mind and, and you just can't shake it, you say, wait a minute, Christ served others to the point they thought he was mad. So let me pray for a brother in Christ and pray that he would have a good day, and pray for his children, and pray for protection over him. And then I just go out of my way to start praying for somebody else and be selfless, so I'm in the Spirit, instead of just saying, oh, Lord, it's me again. Lord, help me. Lord, I need. And Lord, give us. Once you start saying, wait, 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 wait. He'll take care of me. Lord, help them. Lord, protect them. Lord, they were good to me. Would you reward them? Would you give them a benefit, Lord? Think about it. When we really start praying for others in our church, that's when God gets the glory. We're really working together. Bring in the thought, every captivity in the obedience of Christ, verse 6, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Having a spirit of repentance, just saying, man, <laughs> I messed up. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Who am I? Who am I? Uh, if you would, go to Daniel 11. We'll finish there. Last place, Daniel 11. Remember, guys, you are a wartime church. You're a wartime church. It's out there. It's happening. You're part of it. You can't stick your head in the sand and say, I'm not in this war. You can't say, no, I, I minister in other ways. I don't do it through preaching the gospel. Now, I understand, ladies, you are uniquely different. God has made us specific. Some ladies are soul winners. Some ladies are support troops. Gunny knows what I'm talking about, right? Some people stayed back with the artillery, and some stayed back with the food. And we see in Samuel, what, or, or what is it, First Samuel, I think it's like 20, 
no, it must be chapter 30 with Ziklag, where those that stayed with the stuff, they were rewarded with the rest. They parted alike. And I believe when mom stays at home with the babies and dad goes out soul winning, that we're all rewarded, that my wife gets an eternal reward for helping dad to go soul winning. I, I truly believe that through and through. Um, but we're not all the same. When you can go soul winning, you go soul winning. And ladies, when you cannot, you pray for those that can. And you say, Lord, help me to train up these children to memorize verses. Wasn't that great? We had a visitor that could quote a verse this morning. Woo, what are the odds of that? When you, we, we, have a, um, we have a series of verses. We, have, we call it our soul winner's arsenal at our, at our church. And all the kids are going through a list of verses. And it's the soul winning presentation. I mean, like, ramped up. I mean, it's like on steroids. It's like, I mean, you know, I'm not one of these like uh, three verses from Romans and pray a prayer. No, 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 come on. Let's really get down dirty. Let's have some answers for the Pentecostals and answers for everybody else. And so we've got a whole list of verses and every week they have a new verse. They memorize it and they're going through a system. And I've got kids that are quoting verses better than I can. And I'm proud of them. That's the next generation. That's how we're going to win this battle is when they're growing up and they're serving the Lord and they, their friends are serving the Lord and they're working together to go out and be soul winners. I mean, that's exciting. That's when you know there's hope. There's hope for this good fight of faith. Amen. Daniel 11. I wish I could just give you all good news, but with war, there's not all good news. There's also trials and tribulations. But God gets the victory through them. If you'll look at verse 32 with me. And such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries. Now listen to this, guys. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Amen. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. The people that know their God, they're going to do many mighty works. They're going to preach the gospel. They're going to tear down these strongholds. They're going to put on their armor. And they're going to go out every day that they can, and they're going to preach the gospel. And they're not just going to change a soul's destiny. They're going to change a person's life. And then that life will then change a family. And then they get a family on fire for God. And then all of a sudden, the children are excited for God. I mean, this is how it works. And God wants you to just reach out and get that one and just be surprised what the Lord can do. Then get them to come and be part of the local church and let them, their kids start learning the verses. Let their kids learn to sing the B-I-B-L-E. Let their kids learn to be part of worshiping the Lord. And that feel natural instead of all the weird, bogus stuff that's out there. But I said it, it comes with a warning, some bad news. We're at war. There's going to be casualties. We've lost enough, haven't we? We've lost, I've seen enough families fall out of church because of some jerk behind the pulpit, some narcissist, some whatever, legalist. God forbid I would kick somebody out of a church that God is using to grow in that church. We have to tread very lightly. I believe God's plan is we come together, we grow together, and God uses other men in the church to hold up the hands of the pastor to support him. It's not all on him. He's not the only preacher. Hey, our, the truth comes from here. I believe God's will is that other men stand behind the pulpit and they teach as well. And God gets the glory through it all. Notice he says in verse 33, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. And they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for an appointed time. I believe we're going to see a time where Bible-believing Christians are going to go through a hard trial, a tribulation and persecution where the affliction of the devil will come upon us. It tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon, that the devil will pour out his wrath on God's people. And I'm just warning you. You may experience that. You may lose family members or lose lives. You may suffer, lose a job, or lose a house. But the neat part is sandwiched in between verses 32 and 33. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. If I were the author of the Bible, it wouldn't be perfect. And I would have paired these two together and left everything else out. The people that do know their God, they shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. 
but he kind of has it sandwiched in between. You guys are going to have a hard time. What did Jesus say? The first red letter, suffer. We're going to go through a hard time. We are in the middle of the war. This is a wartime church. I just want to compel you, fight the good fight of faith. The battle is on. It's already started. You've been drafted. You're in the Lord's army. And he has a plan for you. He has a purpose. We all have different aspects of ministry. But God's will is that we would come together in unity and strengthen the core. My three points were this. The fort, the family, and the feelings. Work on your own feelings. Don't get offended easily. Get your family in the fort. And let's get the next generation ready to fight the good fight of faith. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church. Lord, I ask that you would continue to do a great work here. I ask that you would bless them and protect them. Lord, I thank you for every moment I've had here today. And I just ask that you would get all the honor and all the glory. And ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.